210 here on today's A3OWCCO. I opened up the New York Times on Friday, and I have it sitting in front of me still, and one of the headlines grabbed me. McCain's vote in 2000 is revived in a ruckus. Well, what's interesting is if you go back to 2000, many people look back to what happened in South Carolina, and some suggested that it was the Bush camp that torpedoed John McCain, and that's what people were talking about. And apparently, John McCain said back then that, you know what, I didn't vote for that guy. The person who claims to have heard that is in studio with me. You probably recognize her name. I'm certainly recognize the voice, too. Ariana Huffington, again, post the latest book sitting right in front of me, Right is Wrong. Ariana, thanks for coming in studio. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. I think about what you write in your book, what you've written about, what you write about regularly in Huffington Post, and I'm trying to decide who you're angriest at. Are you angriest at the right, the conservatives, the uh, liberals, the Democrats, or the media? Which one? Well, I, right now, um, I'm angriest at the media because um, the media enabled the hijacking uh, by the right of our country, our democracy, our debate. There's no question that we all have an enormous amount to be outraged over what the Bush administration has done to the country during the last seven and a half years. But the question I'm asking in the book is how were they able to do it? How were they able to get away with it? And the first two chapters are devoted to the media because without the media enabling them, they would not have been able to do what they did. Without the media enabling them in the lead up to the war, after the war, what they did to the economy, we can go step by step, but basically it's all there, the culpability of the media. In some ways, I expected you to go after Fox News Channel. Uh, what I didn't expect was you to go after CNN and CBS, ABC, NBC. I mean, you went after everybody here. My point is that I didn't want to do something that others had done. You know, the, so many people have gone after Fox, and so people now, when they watch Fox, they know what to expect. They know it's going to be, quote-unquote, fair and balanced. But what about uh, Bob Woodward? When you read a book by Bob Woodward, um, you expect something more than what we got with his first two books, I mean, the most recent of the trilogy. You know, there were two books that he, that he wrote when he was given almost unlimited access at the White House in the lead up to the war and after that. And you completely missed the story. You know, there was the administration misleading a nation to war. And Bob Woodward was giving us uh, interesting detail about how many memes were at the cabinet table. And so I describe him as the dumb blonde of American journalists, you know, kind of <laughs> awed by access. So in other words, you're making lots of friends on all sides. A lot of friends. You know, Tim Russert is another one. Uh, Russert Watch, you know, I call him the conventional wisdom zombie. Uh, as a result, MSNBC will not have me on. That's okay. You know, it's like the great thing right now is that there's so many outlets, so many platforms. We no longer have to be dependent on pleasing the three networks. Is the problem the failure to follow up? I mean, you write about this a lot in the book, but, but in general it seems to be, you'll ask the question, and, and every time I've had anybody on of any senior level, including right and left, I'll get the answer that they want to give me rather than the answer to my question. You know right. what I mean? Right. Yes. It's really an interview is about the follow-up, right? Because anybody you are going to have here will be able to answer your first question. I mean, they're trained to do that. But if you embody the conventional wisdom, the the way Russert does, you know, you don't even know what the second question is because you and often his guests, he and his guests often like embody the same conventional wisdom. Um, but the other problem with the media is that very often they assume that every issue has two sides. And um, that's why I call the first chapter Equal Time for Lies. Because not every issue has two sides. And the truth is not always to be found by splitting the difference. Then why is it that we do, and again, you write the, about this in the book too, that we look at the approach from a left and right perspective rather than from some other perspective? Right, what about the right and wrong perspective? You know, again, not every issue can be divided into right versus left. I mean, this has been the amazing realignment of American politics that the media has missed. Uh, just take the war in Iraq. Uh, one of the most eloquent critics of the war is um, a major conservative, Senator Chuck Hager. 
Um, one of the first critics in the House was the Congressman Walter Jones, who is so far on the right that he actually uh, renamed French fries Freedom Fries. Do you remember? <laughs> It, aren't, aren't fries Belgian anyway, as I recall? <laughs> that's what people started finding out. I thought they were Greek. I claim everything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's wise. So, you know, 60 to 70 percent of Americans want the troops to come home. They're not all on the left. So that's what I'm saying about the confused, um, tired way of looking at American politics as right versus left, every issue having two sides. Take global warming. You know, for years we've debated global warming. like. On the one hand, we would have Al Gore, or the equivalent, talking to us about the dangers of global warming. On the other hand, we would have uh, Senator James Inhofe telling us that global warming is a fraud. And the media would kind of wash their hands off responsibility, like Pontius Pilate, and tell the public to sort it out. I sometimes think about it as if somebody said, we're going to talk about Adolf Hitler. Now, dare I say, yeah, we'll go down that path, but I can't imagine where they would say, well, we'll bring somebody on who says he was a horrible man, and I think we can all agree to that. On the other hand, it almost feels like there's an obligation to say, well, we better go out and find somebody who says, you know, that Hitler guy, he, he wasn't a bad guy after all. Yeah, and you know, it is interesting because, like with Hitler, he's crossed that line, sort of like the flat earth. You know, we're not going to be debating the flat earth, whether the earth is flat or not. We're not going to be debating whether Adolf Hitler was good or not. But there's an enormous amount of stuff that we're still debating that we should not be debating. I mean, we should be debating how to deal with global warming. You know, what is the best way to solve the problem, but not whether it exists. Then how do we get to this point? Dare I say it, I, I've watched things like The Daily Show, Colbert, some of the others, and sometimes their analysis is as good or better than anything else that I'm seeing, where they will literally go back and they will pull drops from uh, previous quotes from the president, the vice president, where they will say something totally inconsistent from one another, and then they set them side by side, and yet, did I, did I see that from CBS or anybody else? No, I, I haven't seen it from anybody, and I thought, that's outrageous. Because very often, you have to come from a viewpoint of where the truth is. And sort of John Stewart, or Colbert in his, um, in his own act, kind of really know where the truth is. That's why Colbert contrasts truth with truthiness. Because, you know, truth is That's the right. Truth. He won an award for that, did he not? And then you have truthiness, which is, which is spin, basically. But right now, in, in American politics, there is real confusion about where the truth is and where the delusions are. Then when we hear from the right that the left is out of touch, that uh, their arguments that we need to get out of Iraq are out of touch, those simply aren't true if we're looking at the numbers. If more than the majority of Americans, some 60 plus percent, are saying we need to be out of Iraq right now, it would seem that, well, they're very much in touch if we're, we're talking about what the population wants. Right. But also, if you look at Iraq from the beginning, you know, we've been there for five years now. In the process, um, we, we are breaking the American military. You know, that's the other irony. You have the right that supposedly uh, cares about the troops while they want to paint Democrats as not supporting the troops. And yet it's the right that sent the troops to the war without the proper armor, that when they come home wounded, does not have the proper resources to take care of them. You know that right now we have a thousand suicide attempts among uh, vets every month. I mean, there's a real tragedy going on. And the right is kind of pretending to be the ones that are going to really take care of them. Then why doesn't the media uh, stand up and say this is a, a false premise in the first place? If you're for this, uh, which we will hear, if, if you're for bringing the troops home, you must be against them. And if you're for keeping them there as long as necessary to get the job done, to succeed, to win, if you will, then somehow you're for them. I mean, if, if that is inconsistent with reality, then wouldn't it make sense to say uh, that's inconsistent with reality? It would be amazing. And imagine if there's an interview and, 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 and somebody's asked those questions. That's what is happening. We're not asking politicians those very commonsensical, practical questions. Let's, let's keep talking about that when we come back. We're being joined by Ariana Huffington. She joins me in studio. Of course, you read her um, uh, Huffington Post, which I think takes you in a completely different direction in that you become almost this web uh, uh, source. You're the, the queen in many ways of that. And many people are looking at the new media and what it means. 
and you seem to be uh, succeeding where others are simply trying to understand it. Her latest book, one of her last 12, Right is Wrong. Stay with us. It's 221, and this is today's 830 WCCO.